Hi, I'm Pastor Corey, and you're listening to the Orange United Methodist Sermon Podcast. We're a church in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, that wants to help you find your place in God's story. And we hope this sermon can guide you along that path. Visit orangemethodist.org to find out more information about location, service times, upcoming events, and ways to give. We hope you enjoy. But today we're also missing... Pastor Brad and also Ryan Lutz, as they are both in, in Rocky Mount this weekend as a part of the event called Pilgrimage. Brad has taken our youth, both bands, and they are there experiencing worship together with youth from all across the conference, North Carolina Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. And so as they've been gathered together there, Ryan, who usually is here helping to run our live stream and every all the technology that you see in front of us. Uh, Ryan is there sharing his gifts there, doing the same kind of thing. I think Ryan is running one of the cameras. He's the main camera operator. And so Ryan is sharing his gifts. So uh, we are missing those parts of the team, but we are thankful for the work that they are doing. And we're thankful for the opportunity next Sunday to receive back Pastor Corey. But it's good to be together, whether you are here in person or those that have joined us online. Let's go to God once again in prayer. Lord, we are your people. You've called us. You've offered us the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. And as we respond, we are yours. And so today, in this moment, we, we offer all that we are to you. Lord, we know that you are truly the way maker promise keeper, the light in the darkness. And as you have called us into that light today, Lord, may we receive that which you have prepared. We give thanks for your word as it's been read and now as it is to be proclaimed by the power of your Holy Spirit. Would you transform the words that proceed from my mouth and as they fall upon our ears and penetrate our hearts, may they be changed into the word of God that we need to hear today as individuals and collectively as one body. Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit and all of God's people said, amen. This week we are continuing in our Ships of Faith series. Uh, when we say Ships of Faith, we recognize that there's a lot of ship words that are a part of the way that we live out our faith. And so we've been looking at some of those Ship words, the ships of our faith. And I tell you what, that's a word that you got to be very careful how you're saying, especially in front of a live crowd and uh, cameras that will never forget if you get it wrong. Last Sunday, we did touch on briefly worship, how worship is where we identify or ascribe the value of something. And we demonstrate that value by the way that we respond to it. And so when we worship God, we're ascribing value, how much, showing God how much God is truly worth in our lives. And we demonstrate how we value God through the, th the ships of faith that we've been talking about, through our discipleship, through our fellowship, through our membership, and today as we're talking about through our stewardship. Now, disciples. Discipleship, just going back through each one of those weeks, discipleship, once again, is that intentional decision that we make to be shaped and formed into being the disciples that God has called us to be. So being a disciple, following into that discipleship, means that we are intentionally acting out, learning what it means to be that disciple that God has called us to be. And, and so it's a choice that we have to make to be shaped and formed, whether it's through reading the Bible or studying other devotional books or partnering with others to be able to be shaped and formed. It's that intentional act of being discipled. And then fellowship, as Pastor Brad talked about a couple of weeks ago, fellowship is the way that we encourage and uplift one another. It's just sort of the way that we play, as Pastor Brad said, that we share in that fun time. But those are the times that are so important. It's like Pastor Brad is doing that this weekend with the pilgrimage event and the opportunity to fellowship in between those worship services. Those are the kind of times that our youth will remember 20 years or more from now. Those are the things they'll look back and remember, oh, remember that time we went and did this crazy thing? 
They'll remember those fellowship things. Same thing with us. We won't remember this sermon, but we may remember the encounter that we have with somebody out in the parking lot or something that is said in between. And so that fellowship, and we live into that fellowshipping with one another. That is so such an important part of us living out our faith. And last week, we had a chance to talk about what it means to be a part of the body of Christ through membership. Each one of us are a different part. And the thing is, in the body of Christ, there are no spare parts. Think about it. When you get something that you have to put together, you get out the list of instructions and always includes all the items that come in that box that you're going to need to put this thing together. And the thing is, almost every time when you finish putting something together, you have some spare parts that you don't know what to do with. The thing is, in the body of Christ, there are no spare parts. You are not a spare part. You are an essential part that God has crafted you and designed you perfectly to be a part of the body of Christ. And so if you find yourself over in a drawer and you're not living into the body of Christ, you've made yourself a spare part, but you are not a spare part. You are an essential part of the body of Christ. And God has uniquely gifted you to be a part of that body. So today, we are talking about stewardship, and I imagine that if you've spent any time around the church, when you hear that word stewardship, you immediately think, we're talking about money, we're talking about finances, we're talking about giving. And it's interesting because when I went into the ministry, I was always terrified to talk about money, even though Jesus himself talks so much about money and uses money time and time again as illustrations in his parables. But it's something that we get uncomfortable and uneasy about. And I remember at my very first church that I was pastoring, I was serving at Leslie United Methodist Church, and I was still in school at Duke. And I remember one of the members of that church said, it's okay for you to preach about anything except don't talk about politics, don't talk about money, and don't talk about UNC basketball. I guess he said that because of the school I was attending at the time. I don't know. Well, I can assure you I am not going to talk about uh, any of those things. I will not talk about UNC basketball. I will not talk about politics in this setting, but I will talk about money because money is what it, it moves us. It, it, it's the way that we d drive our lives so many times. It's what gets us up early in the morning to go to work. It's what causes us to try to save on our bills. Money is such an important part of our life, and I think that's why Jesus spoke into it so much. And so it is a faithful part of being a part of the body of Christ for us to consider stewardship and what stewardship might mean for us to be able to have a whole and a healthy life. And stewardship, when we talk about it, it is a big picture item. It's not just one part of our lives. It is truly at the core of all that we do. When I think of stewardship, I mentioned last week how one of the things that I have always been intrigued by is the meaning of words and the etymology of words, history of it. How a word may have been used in one way years and years and years ago, but then over time, the meaning of that word sort of changes. And we may not even realize how we might be living into the meaning of that word. One of the things I've always found fascinating is uh, the meaning of names even, the history of a name. And it's always fascinating. I always like to look up when someone's life here on earth has been completed, to look up the meaning of their name. And it's always fascinating the ways that many times they've lived in to the meaning of that name. So words are important, especially the history of those words. And so the history of that word steward, stewardship, the history of the word steward means stew, that first part of that would be touching on a house or, or a barn or, or a property. And then ship, that, that, that word, stew word, that word part, that is a guard, a guard, a guardian. And so when we look at stewardship, that means that we are guardian or keepers. We're living into being guardians or keepers of these things. And so when we look at that, we think of stewardship goes far beyond just our finances. We can look at stewardship as we are guardians or keepers of our environment. We recognize that we have limited natural resources and, and we recognize the climate change that is continuing to take place. And so we ourselves have got to be stewards of our environment. We've got to be stewards of our children. 
We've got to make sure that our children are learning. That's why it's so important that the children are able to be back in school so that they can learn those important things and be able to continue to grow into becoming faithful uh, people, citizens within our society. We also, as we are stewards of them, we also make sure that we have to offer protections for them. One of the ways we live that out here at the church is we have a safe sanctuaries policy. Anybody that is having anything to do with children has to undergo a safe sanctuaries training. And that training and it, it makes sure that they understand what you can do, what you can't do, the things we have to look out for. And it's the ways that we are going to offer protections for our children and or our youth. We're stewards. We're living into stewardship when we practice offering that protection. We're being that guard. We also are stewards of our stuff, our things. It's whether it means that at home we might have an alarm system or a ring doorbell camera that we can see who's coming and going. We, we want to offer protections for our stuff. We're stewards. We live out being stewards all the time. In the context of the church, stewardship is really just goes beyond just that giving, though. It is that protection that we offer for one another. It's the ways that we live into offering that, that, that safe space so that people can come and to understand who they are in, within the kingdom of God. And when we understand stewardship, we are able to recognize that this whole great big world does not belong to us. It's not ours. We're just the keepers of it, or the guards of it. Unless your name is Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, it's probably easy to understand that the world does not belong to you. For us, we recognize we're just keepers. We're trustees. We're guardians for a period of time. And the things that we have really are truly a gift from God. Stewardship is this, this big picture that we've got to look at and it's that thing that, some, that we recognize that when we live into faithful stewardship, being guardians, whether it's of our environment, whether it's of our children, whether it's of our things, when we live into being good stewards, it's kind of like the butterfly effect. It's something that has significant impact that goes way beyond our years and way beyond ourselves. The butterfly effect, you, I'm sure you've heard of that theory before where a butterfly flaps its wings and it, eventually the ramification sets off this chain reaction that leads to a tornado. The, the impact of what we do now as stewards is something that we may never even get to see the fruit or the merit of. But when we're faithful in being those stewards of the way that we take care of our environment, the way that we take care of our children and youth, the way that we take care of our things. We're making an impact that will be felt years and years down the road. Friday night, my sister sent me a text as she lives in Rocky Mountain. She had gone with their youth over to pilgrimage, and she took a picture of one of our church vans that they were right next to in the church parking lot. And I hoped that it was not rocking and rolling too much as they were leaving that night. But I, I asked her who was the speaker. I, I hadn't even been made aware of who the speaker was this weekend at pilgrimage. And she told me the name of a youth that I had over 20 years ago in my youth group, who's now gone on and graduated seminary and is serving as a pastor. And it made me think once again, little did I know 20 years ago, the stewardship that I was putting over this youth, that God would redeem one day, 20 some years later, to be able to speak in front of thousands of youth, to be able to say, speak of the good news of Jesus Christ. These are our understanding of stewardship means we're putting something in that we may never see the fruit of. But we've got to be those guardians, those keepers. And as United Methodist, we see that lived out each time, each time that we give. You may not know this, but every out of every dollar that is giving to, to this church, at least 10% of that goes to the United Methodist Church to be able to help such things as UMCOR, United Methodist Committee on Relief, which means that out of every dollar that you give, 10 cents of that may go to help people have boots on the ground in the midst of a natural disaster. It may help to fund scholarships for people that need to be able to go on to seminary, to attend schools. Those dollars that we give make an impact, and we may never see the fruit of it fully borne out. And so we want to look at stewardship today by considering this passage of Scripture that Josh read just a few moments ago. 
We can learn a lot of things by what Paul is saying about stewardship, I think, as he's writing in his second letter to the church in Corinth. Now, one thing that that should tell you right away, when he says that it's Second Corinthians, that means this. Paul usually wrote letters to a church who was in the midst of conflict or controversy. He wrote 1 Corinthians, addressing certain issues that were going on within the life of that church and offering encouragement and support to them so that they might be reconciled and to be the church that God had called them to be. So the fact that he's having to write a second letter, what does that tell you? That tells you that they didn't quite get it right the first time. So Paul's having to write them once again. Let's make sure. And see, once again, there had been this controversy that had erupted within the church of Corinth this controversy and conflict that had created this disruption in the life of the church, so much so that they were not living into being the part of the body of Christ that God had always called them to be. In fact, in this passage of Scripture, Paul is addressing something that they had started a year before, but because this conflict had erupted, they had quit. What it was that they had quit, they had been taking up a contribution that was being sent to the church in Jerusalem that was to be distributed among the poor. Now, when we recognize that the Jerusalem was the home of Judaism, that's where the temple was. That's where people would make their pilgrimages. And so when people became a follower of Jesus Christ, they became a follower of a group that many people looked down upon and many people looked at and didn't understand, the sect of the Jewish faith. And when you don't understand something, many times we become afraid of something. We, don't, we're, we fear the things that we don't understand. And so many of these Christians, these people that had converted to being followers of the way, followers of Jesus Christ, they had fallen on hard times, financially difficult times to be able to provide for their home, for their families. And so churches from across the region would take up these collections and these collections would then be sent to Jerusalem to be able to be distributed among the poor. The church in Corinth had already begun this collection, but this conflict had erupted within the life of the church and they had ceased to continue to make that contribution, to make a difference. This was life or death for the poor in Jerusalem. And something had stirred their hearts so much that they quit making that contribution. And so as Paul is writing to them, he's writing to address all the different conflicts and controversies that they are enduring. And one of those things he's addressing is how they had stopped living into being fully a part of the body of Christ. How they themselves had ceased to live a generous life. It's interesting, if you go back and read at the very beginning of this chapter, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul begins to reference the generosity of these other churches. He's speaking of the churches in Macedonia who are begging to be able to give, who are begging to participate in this contribution. And even though these churches in Macedonia were those in extreme poverty, they were the ones that were making sure that they wanted to make a contribution to go to Jerusalem to make such a difference in the lives of others. It reminds me how as they're begging, it reminds me of back in Exodus. After the people of Israel had been going through this journey throughout the wilderness, God had called on Moses to build up the tabernacle. Many of you may remember the tabernacle was going to be this place where God would be located. It would be the, where, the place where sacrifices would be offered, where burnt offerings would take place. It would be where they would keep the Ark of the Covenant, which was God's remind, symbolic presence that God was always with them. And so as God has given them all the instructions about making the tabernacle, God then calls on Moses to ask the people for a contribution. To tell the people all whose hearts are moved was the specific instructions that Moses gives. All whose hearts are moved to give gold, silver, bronze, to be able to give fine linens and everything that was going to be going into making up the, the tabernacle. And so as Moses makes the call, he says, we are taking up the offering. We're taking up the contribution. The people begin, their hearts are moved and they begin to bring all this gold. They bring all this silver. They had received all of this when they fled from Egypt. The people of Egypt gave them all of these things so that they would just get them to get out, to go and leave. And so they had all this gold and they have all this silver. They have all this bronze. They have all these jewels. They have all these fine linens. And you know what they had done earlier with some of that gold, don't you? You remember the golden calf? 
Well, now they've got these things. You know, sometimes we get these prized possessions. Look at what I got. I earned this. I deserve this. This is mine. But that's not what happened here. All whose hearts were moved, they began to bring their contributions of the gold, silver, bronze, fine linens, jewels, and gems. All of these things were going into the tabernacle. And it was so much. They gave so much that the people came to Moses and said, Moses, tell them to stop giving. They're giving too much. I want to serve a church that one Sunday I get to tell you, you know what? Stop giving. You've given too much. Your hearts have been moved too much. That's what I think about when I think about the church that Paul references. The churches in Macedonia, they're in extreme poverty. And they want to continue to give. Give to somebody else. That heart of generosity is still there within them. In some ways, I think Paul might be kind of trying to shame the church in Corinth. You know, because the church in Corinth, they've, they've prospered. The people in Corinth have prospered. They've done quite well. And as they've done quite well, they've stopped their giving. And so they just continue to grow and grow and grow in their wealth and their financial status. And so Paul bringing up this church in Macedonia, I think it's almost kind of like bringing about that shame on the church in Corinth. Makes me think about, I was a part of a mission trip to downtown Atlanta, Georgia several years ago. And we were in ministry with the hungry and the homeless. And as we were in ministry with the hungry and the homeless, one of the things that we wanted to do also was we put on a special carnival for a community that was in desperate poverty. And we wanted to do something for the children. Something as a way of showing them that God loves them. Kind of like we did just a couple of weeks ago when we had trunk or treat for our community and for our children. We wanted to do something just to be able to show these kids the love of Jesus Christ. And so we had gone out into the project to be able to share the news of this carnival that we were going to be having nearby. And on that day came all these children were coming and they were playing games, and they were winning candy. They were getting all this stuff. And one of my little silly games that I like to play, little tricks with kids, is I, I see all their candy, and I say, Ooh, is that for me? Is that for me? And kids are like, usually you expect them to say, No, no. I stopped playing that game. Because I remember going up to a child and saying, Oh, look at all that candy. Is that for me? And the child reached into the candy grabbed a handful, and extended it and gave, wanted to give it to me. I did not need the candy, folks. But the child felt it within. They wanted to share. They wanted to give. Even in extreme poverty, they felt this need to be able to give, to experience this, this, this act of generosity. I was ashamed. I was ashamed that I had even played that game. I tried to tell the child, no, 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 you keep it. It's yours. You, you keep it. I insisted. And all I could do, ultimately, was to receive it. Because I didn't want to rob them of the blessing, like we referenced last week, of the gift. Paul brings this up to the church in Corinth, about the church in Macedonia is of extreme poverty, and yet they are begging to give. And here they are because of this conflict. They've stopped doing what they were doing before. And he's calling on them. He reminds them that they're giving. He says their gift in, in the verse 8, he says that I'm testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. See, our stewardship the way that we take care of our things, the way that we protect our children, the way that we give back to God, all of that together is a test of how genuine our love is for God. It's a part of that worship, showing God how much he truly is worth. Our stewardship is that test of the genuineness of our love. Our stewardship is that ascribing the value that we have for God. The thing is, sometimes... We forget. Sometimes we forget that what all that we have 
is a gift from God. Sometimes we forget the true significance of the gift of Jesus Christ, how he lived, how he died, so that we might be reconciled to God. Sometimes we live in a way that we, we forget. We don't guard that. We don't protect that. We don't work on that relationship with God. We just go through the motions. And as we do, we neglect to live fully into that stewardship and that relationship that we have with God. We quit. I'm not saying that we quit giving, but we quit recognizing the significance and the meaning of that gift. Folks, every time that we make a contribution to the church or every time we look for the ways that we're going to protect our children or the youth, every time we look to protect one another, we're living into the value that God has for you. God looks upon you and says, you are a child of God, one that he was willing to pay a price that we ourselves could never pay. God looks upon you and he says, you are worth it. And when we look upon God, and every time we make that contribution, every time we make that gift, may it be something that we say, God, you're worth it. We want to make this gift as a way of demonstrating our faithfulness to one another and our gratitude and thankfulness for what you've done for us. Folks, I give thanks because the way that you here at Orange have continued to live out that faithfulness through your generosity truly is enabling people to find their place in God's story. Just this coming week on Thursday, once again, I, we have volunteers who will be partnering with Porch of Hillsboro to be able to help distribute food to those who are in some of the greatest need in our community. And that's only possible because the way that you have continued to give and give and give to this church, enabling us to send people out, enabling us to help pro provide that much-needed food to those in need. Josh just talked about a little while ago how we're resuming our Backpack Buddies ministry. And what a precious thing that we can do to a child in desperate need to offer this gift, to show them you are loved, you are valued, you are are worth it. The way that we live and the way that we give, it demonstrates our worship in all that we do, but especially in our stewardship. That's the test, as Paul says. It's the test of our, how genuine that love is. And I continue to stand before you giving thanks for the way I've seen that lived out here. And the things that you're doing here are creating a butterfly effect. We may not see it for 20 years, but the things you're doing here are helping others find their place in God's story. And the things you're doing through your giving and the way that you're living and serving is truly bringing God glory. I give thanks for all that you've done. I give thanks for all that you will continue to do. Let us pray. Lord God, so many times when we think about all that you have done for us, it's it's too much for us to even understand and comprehend. We don't deserve all that you've done. And yet you paid that price anyway. Lord, we give thanks for the ultimate act of sacrifice when you gave your son Jesus Christ. Who for our sake made himself poor. So that we might be reconciled to you. And experience the full richness of life. And so, God, as, as we have the opportunity to participate in the body of Christ, to be able to offer ourselves to be stewards, to pro offer protection for our world, our environment, for our children, for our youth, for one another. Lord, I pray that our hearts might be moved in such a way that we are able to see that our gift is making a difference in the lives of others whether we ever even see it or not. And so, Lord, may you continue to move our hearts in such a way that brings you glory. We pray these things in the name of Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit and all of God's people said, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's sermon. Please join us again next week. In the meantime, you can find us online at orangemethodist.org.